Welcome to Beauty and the Biz. Discover how to grow your practice with effective cosmetic patient attraction, conversion, and retention advice from author, speaker, trainer, and cosmetic practice business and marketing coach, Catherine Maley, MBA. Hello and welcome to Beauty and the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of the cosmetic practice. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to cosmetic practices to get them more patients and more profits. Now, today's episode is really special because I have a special guest. And here's why I'm going to uh, bring on special guests, because after consulting with plastic surgeons all over the world for the last 19 years, this is what I know for sure. There is no one way to grow a cosmetic practice. There are too many variables involved. So every surgeon has um, all sorts of things like the longevity, um, their experience, the area that they're practicing in, their own personal interests, um, even their skills, not surgical skills, but their skills in management and leadership, um, their interest in marketing, um, their tech savviness, their desire to learn and grow. All of that makes up a very unique practice, but it's absolutely great to learn from each other. That's why we go to meetings and we learn, right? So um, when you listen to our guest, just take some of those ideas and then adapt them to you and your own personality and your own practice. Because the reality is nobody else is like you. You are unique. So you want to use everything you can to just grow the practice that you like going to. And that's another thing. I find everybody, especially consultants like me, um, I'm not like this, of course, but everyone else is. They tell you what to do. And frankly, if they don't understand you and where you're coming from, it won't matter because it's not going to stick. You have to enjoy going to your practice and you have to really enjoy building it because there's nothing easy about that. So please um, listen to everybody, but then listen to your own gut and do what you think is right for you. So speaking of unique, Um, My guest today is super unique in how he differentiates himself and how he positions himself in the marketplace. His name is Christian Subio. I love that name, Subio. And he's a board-certified plastic surgeon. And um, I believe, have you been in practice for four years? Uh, Correct, in private practice, yeah. Before that, I was was employed by a hospital for a couple years. Gotcha. Okay, so he's been in private practice for only four years, and he's grown a ton since then. And he's in a small suburb in Philadelphia. Although I say small suburb because it has this um, small town feel to it. It's called Newton Town Square. But it's actually, I mean, Philadelphia is, you know, a a huge city. But it just feels good. And what I liked about it, uh, when I went to visit, the first thing I saw was a Whole Foods that moved in across the highway from him. And I thought, holy cow, is he in the right area? Because, you know, if Whole Foods moves in, that's telling you a lot. So he's also um, speaking a lot at the medical meetings, and he'll, he, can, he can talk more about that. But um, I just want to welcome Dr. Christian Subio. Well, thanks for having me, Catherine. I've been looking forward to it. It's, uh, you, you've, you know, since we brought you on as a consultant at our practice, you've done wonders for us. And um, your, your advice, whenever you have something to say, we always listen. So thanks for having me. It's, a, it's a, you know, an honor to be on. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that plug. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Subio, why don't you tell um, the audience, how did you get into plastic surgery? And just... Describe your practice in your competitive landscape and your patient demographics, that kind of thing. Um, I got into plastics basically, it was kind of on a whim, actually. I'm not sure many plastic surgeons end up in this field on a whim, but I think I was like 16 or 17. I was in high school and I was either going to go to art school, but um, it didn't really wasn't, I was a little bit listless. I didn't know how it, I would make a career of it. And then I saw some documentary about um, plastic surgeons treating acid throwing victims in in, uh, in India. So I thought that would be an interesting way to apply art to a, a more stable career. Um, so, you know, 15 years later, I end up, you know, graduating plastic surgery. I really didn't know what I was getting into at the time, but uh, luckily it worked out, you know, because I love what I do. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's a long, circuitous route and ended, ended me up as a plastic surgeon. Um, and, uh, you know, so like you said, I, I practice in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And Philadelphia, I think it's a at this point, it's the sixth biggest city in the state. So like you said, it's a very big city. Uh, I practice in the suburbs uh, west of the city. Um, so it's, you know, um, you know, a typical suburban landscape of a big city. You know, lots of plastic surgeons, as any big 
as any big city is going to have. Um, but, you know, not quite the same landscape as New York City, which is just an hour and a half north or, or certainly not L.A. or Miami. Um, it's more of a typical suburban setting of a, of a large city. So lots of plastic surgeons, lots of competition. And if you don't stay at the top of your game, you're going to fall behind. So um, always trying to think of new ways, as we all are, to, to, to stay at the forefront. Nice. Um, the um, patient demographics, are they any different there than somewhere else? Um, I don't think so. You know, barring certain areas like New York City and L.A., I, I consider those areas like the outliers. You know, New York, L.A., Miami, and then everything else. Everything else, I think, falls, you know, within a generally similar subset of patients and demographics. You know, um, my my practice tends to skew a little bit younger, I think, because, you know, as I'm sure you'll you know, get into, uh, I've made a... Uh, you know, something of a name for myself on Instagram, and I'm using lots of digital marketing to, to reach my patient base. So I think that, you know, typically is going to skew a bit younger. But, I, I you know, like anyone else, I'll see patients from 20 years old to 80 years old. But I think uh, if I'm looking at the median, um, my, my patients may be a little bit younger. Okay. And I do remember when I was in his office, um, the saying is, everybody is a candidate for something. <laughs> I love that. So. Yeah. Um, so is, let's talk, go back to you being an artist because that is such a great differentiator. A lot of surgeons talk about how they're different, but but different in um, not a way that correlates to plastic surgery. You can use your art skill as a differentiator to prove or to help prove that you are. It helps you be a better plastic surgeon. And it's funny. The, um, before I even knew who you were. I often go online and I watch, I just look around. I look at what other plastic surgeons are doing all over the United States or the world for that matter. And I ran into you somehow, just, just like a patient when you're clicking around and that's, what's the problem with all the marketing today. Everyone's just busy clicking. So, you know, you have like a nanosecond to get somebody's attention, but I happen to click on your website and you have a killer introductory video um, that intertwines your artistic skill with your skill as a plastic surgeon, it really caught my eye and I never forgot it. And then it was so weird that we ended up working together because it was just so random. So um, just how do you use your art skill to market you and to show you're different than somebody else? Um, you know, it's funny. I, I think, you know, I, I had read one of your books like three or four years ago, um, like when I was first starting out, when I'm coming up with my business plan and I read your book, and, and I remember there was a portion about, you know, you know, finding your brand, finding what makes you different. And uh, like I mentioned, I almost went to art school. So I was like, there you go. That obviously fits hand in hand with being a plastic surgeon, such a visual, you know, a visual field, a visual medium, you know, operating on patients as living works of art. It just made sense. So I'm like, you know what? I'm a good artist. And that uh, just was natural to kind of seize upon that and make that my selling point. Because patients can relate to that. They, you know, someone who can draw and sculpt, it just, you know, is intuitive that what follows would be that they could also sculpt human tissues and, you know, have an artistic eye for creating a good result. So that just made sense. And, um, you know, I kind of incorporate that from, you know, all my marketing. We have a new tagline that we just got trademarked. Uh, it's become art. So quick, simple, catchy tagline that kind of you know, incorporates that very vision that, you know, become living art. Um, so we use that on a lot of our marketing materials. Um, like you mentioned on the, on the video on the website, either there's, it's me painting. Um, you know, when I'm with a patient in the room, I bust out a, um, a drawing pad when I'm trying to explain to them what I'm going to do in a procedure. So we try to touch upon that in all aspects of what we do from the, from the marketing to the website, to the consultation. It, we try to make that a um, recurring theme. I love that. When I was at the office, you can see his art throughout the office. And it just kept bringing home for a consumer patient trying to figure out who to go to. It just kept saying, artist, he's an artist. He, you know, he's aesthetically skilled. Um, that helped a lot. So congratulations on that. So yeah, patients will say that as well when they come in, like, well, I had a couple consults, but and, and in the consult room is a big painting that I've done. And they'll look up, but, but you're an artist. So you know, that, uh, it's, just a, it's a big selling point, and it just makes sense. Good for you. Uh, now, let's talk about when you first got into practice, or let's put it this way, when you left the hospital and you wanted to go out on your own, because you did that, you know, post-recession and post-everything. I mean, you, it, 
it's almost a jungle out there at this point, frankly. So you went out on your own. How in the world did you, did you set yourself up in the hospital first to, like, how did you work that out, the transition between the hospital and solo practice? I kind of suspected that I, I'm more, you know, my personality lends itself more towards autonomy and being my own boss and entrepreneurialism. So I, I kind of knew, you know, that uh, right out of residency that I probably wouldn't be ending up long term employed by a hospital punching a clock. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it's kind of scary just to go out of, you know, on your own right from day one, graduating from residency and hang a shingle and, and try to make it. So, you know, um, I did a fellowship in microsurgery. I got a job at the hospital where I trained for, I think I was there for three years. Just kind of, you know, cut my teeth, get my sea legs, learning how to operate, uh, you know, learning, of course, you learn in residency, but really honing the craft so that, um, so that, and as well, saving money with the idea that I would open my own practice. So after a couple of years at the hospital, you know, I felt, you know, I'd saved enough money and gotten enough experience and finally took the plunge. But it's a scary thing. You know, like you said, there's competition everywhere. And um, I remember asking around the, the local practitioners, like, hey, what's the what's the atmosphere like around Philly? Like, uh, I'm thinking of coming back. And it's always very, oh, well, it's a very competitive area and very pessimistic. Um, you know, not very encouraging, um, but you know what? I knew I wasn't happy where I was, and um, and I was getting paid well at the hospital. Pla- hospital employed plastic surgeons make a good living, um, but it wasn't about the money for me. It was about you know autonomy and you know enacting a vision. And um, so for me, even if I didn't make as much money, um, that was fine, and I was taking a risk, and that was fine. Uh, ultimately, it all worked out because you know I I think when you have a passion for something, then it's, it's it's going to work out. So I'm glad I took the plunge, but um, it wasn't easy. And and for anyone who's listening who might be considering doing something similar, I would say if you're passionate about it, go ahead and do it because, you know, the, from passion will follow hard work and from hard work and, and skill uh, will, will, will follow success. So the first year out, how did you start? I mean, did you have to go door to door or what did you do? Um, I was lucky enough where with my job, I was able to transition slowly over a year and a half where I was working one or two days a week at the hospital and, you know, three days at my office. So I slowly kind of built it up, you know, lots of advertising through a lot of money at advertising. Um, and uh, I didn't really go door to door. I didn't really go to other offices. To I, I realize that's a typical thing that you're told to do is go around to the surrounding practices and family care and taking lots of call at hospitals. But um, uh, I just kind of dove into it with, you know, uh, more guerrilla tactics, you know, um, you know, email blasts, doing local events, um, answering like thousands of questions on real self, um, uh, you know, uh, Instagram, Facebook, you know, more, more, you know, kind of guerrilla tactics in, in, in marketing rather than the tried and true traditional ways. I didn't feel like taking call every, you know, every second or third night at a local hospital and getting called in for, for, for that stuff. Um, uh, that wasn't really appealing to me after, you know, after so many years. I, I, I kind of like, you know, I felt like I was done paying my dues and I just want to get into it and, and try to use creativity and ingenuity to market myself. So who, when you open your doors, who came with you? Was it just you and then did you have to hire... Yeah, or what, how, how yeah I hired a practice manager, um, an esthetician. I got a you know a couple devices. You know, I had a business loan, of course. So I hired you know did the build out. Um, did uh, you know hired a practice manager, uh, esthetician, and um, and that was really it. And in the beginning, um, and it just slowly built from there. Oh, huh. good for you. Um, by the way, your practice is perfectly – he's on a, an incredible highway, and he it's a, it's a uh, self, what's called self-standing building, which actually didn't you just buy it recently? Correct, yeah. Good, good move. And he's got a really good signage. So he, it says Subio Plastic Surgery. So um, the, the traffic there is amazing. Not a ton of foot traffic, but the car traffic. Has that been helpful for you to be where you are? Physically? Yeah, I think so, because uh, I'm so lucky to have good signage. Um, mm-hmm. 
and you know, it sounds like it would be a you know, just an afterthought or nothing, but it's it's really it's like a mini billboard, and you know, it's it's the main road that goes through you know this particular suburb, um, and you know, it's it's really like a mini billboard. I get patients all the time. Oh, how'd you hear about this? Once in a while, usually at least once or twice a week. Oh, well, I pass the sign all the time. And yeah. even if they're not coming in, they at least know the name. Um, so it's great for brand awareness, even if it's not directly relating in patient uh, patient consults. I'm sure that you know just the, the brand awareness has has resulted in consults that I have not directly attributed to that. Mm-hmm. So um, for marketing, because that's always my favorite topic, just trying to figure out how you market yourself to the world. Did you have a strategy for how much was going to be digital or how much was going to be um, how much time you're going to spend on real self? Did you put together any kind of plan for how you were going to um, proportion your time to where the patients are? Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you're first starting out, you know, the, the revenue isn't there. So I put first and foremost free, you know, ways to, you know, Free advertising, obviously, is, is so appealing. It's just a matter of trying to make it work for you. So, you know, um, Real Self at the time, I think Real Self, when I, when I first started doing that three years ago, was a different beast than it is today. For sure. Um, you know, it's, the return on Real Self is just nothing what it was two or three years ago. So I don't really spend any time on it now. But two or three years ago, that was free marketing. I'd answer questions every day. I'd come in and spend half an hour answering questions. Um, and that did result at the time in, in patients. You know, again, I wouldn't do that now, but it, it, two or three years ago, it was a way to you know, free advertising that got patients in my door. Um, you know, doing local events, um, uh, giving talks to local clubs and things like that, that was free. Um, and it got my name out and it did result in some, some consults. Um, so it's, there's no one free home run. But doing a, a bunch of different free avenues like local talks, local outreach, um, you, know, uh, you know, real self at the time, uh, Instagram. Instagram has been huge for me. And that's more of a time commitment than spending, you know, as opposed to a financial investment. That's a time investment. But I think, you know, coming out the gates, you have to be very creative in finding ways because the revenue won't be there. So you don't have the, you don't have, you know, $20,000 a month to throw at advertising when you first start out the gates. So um, you have to come up with creative ways to find the free advertising until you can afford those other things when you're more busy and you don't have time to invest in those free options. And I say that all the time. You either are going to invest money or time or both, but you don't, nothing's free, period. So let's talk about Instagram because you really have cornered that market. How many followers do you have now? Um, just over 50,000 now. <laughs> That's great. Um, now, really, you know, be realistic and tell them, tell them how did you get 50,000 Instagram followers and, and what does what effort do you put into it and then what do you get out of it? Um, you know, again, much like real self, Instagram is a different beast than it was, you know, even just two or three years ago, that landscape has really changed. When I first got, got into it, it was out of, you know, really just boredom. Because I was, you know, just just looking for a creative outlet. You know, like I said, I almost went to art school 20 years ago. And then after surgical residency, you know, medical school, surgical residency, working as a microsurgeon, there was no time for me to have any creative outlet. So when Instagram came along, I kept, people kept telling me about it and telling me about it. I'm like, no, nah, whatever, whatever. And finally, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm bored of, I need to start doing some creative things. So I started posting for the business, you know, funny videos, silly videos, educational videos. Um, uh, just and some of them, like if you if you go, if you see my Instagram page, some of the videos are not what you'd expect from a typical from a surgeon. They're you know more humor, like they're they're kind of funny and silly and like irreverent and not what you'd expect for a surgeon. So when I first started doing this, I, I honestly thought, well, this is going to lose me some patients, but I, I frankly don't care because you know this is something I need to do to be happy to have some creative outlet. But I found that people loved it. You know, this again two years ago it was a lot easier to grow an Instagram account then. I kept putting out good quality content, and bit by bit, it would grow um, a lot faster than it does these days because the algorithm is different. But you know, two or three years ago, it was easier to grow an Instagram account, and I just kept putting out more and more content. And it was educational, funny. It was, it was you know, with no ego, I could say it's very high quality content that I put out because that's my hobby. 
as you mentioned, it's a time investment. If you're going to you know, create quality content on Instagram, there's no two ways about it. You have to spend the time. And I did and do spend a lot of time on Instagram. I don't go, I don't golf, I don't play tennis, I don't yacht, I don't do anything. You know, I don't do anything that a lot of surgeons out there do. I just have my phone on Instagram, make my videos, make my posts, and that's my outlet. So I've been, I've been able to kind of, you know, make that a hobby of mine to work for my business because it certainly you have to put in the time. And I would, I would say if there's any people out there that are, you know, maybe not so Instagram savvy and are looking to get into it, you know, it, it's tougher these days for sure. But I would say it's still worth the, um, it's still worth the struggle if you, as long as you dedicate time to it. Now. You could outsource it, but people, if if people are going to get to know you and your brand via Instagram, via social media, it really has to be either you or someone in your office doing it because people will know if you've outsourced it. It, it loses your, it washes out your identity completely. So, you you know, I would say if you're going to do it yourself as a business owner, as a plastic surgeon, dermatologist, whatever, then peel off half hour, get get to work a half hour early every morning for a year. And you know, answer some questions, or do an Instagram live, or just spend the time on making a good post. Because I think you know, if you if you want to get gains out of Instagram, it's harder than ever. But you have to put the time in and make quality content. Because in the end, content is going is going to be what uh, what drives uh, business your way. Well, I also noticed you got really good at video production as well. So, how important is that for social media? It's. I think. I think it's really important. Um, and again, like two years ago, this was, you know, just born out of creative frustration. But these days, you can learn anything you want on on, on YouTube. I was just talking with my dad about this today. Like, um, he was fixing something around the house. I said to him, "Isn't it amazing what you can learn on YouTube these days?" And he said, "The Christian, you can anything. There's there's not a thing you couldn't imagine you couldn't learn on YouTube." And he's absolutely right. And that's exactly what I did. I said, "You know what? I'm about to hire. I remember I wanted to do like a two minute video." Um, for Instagram. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I could hire a crew. Let me start to price this out. And everyone I talked to for a couple of hours, for a lighting guy, a sound guy, and a video guy, it was like thousands, maybe like $3,000 to bring a crew out for a couple of hours, probably a lot more. Um, and I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to spend $3,000 for a, a one or two minute clip. And then two weeks from now, I'm going to want to do it again. That, that could be wildly expensive. So I'm like, why don't I just learn how to do this on my own? I can, you know, YouTube, get on YouTube, watch a bunch of videos, learn how to, the basics of, you know, shooting film and, and audio and lighting and editing. And, you know, don't get me wrong. It, it took me probably like a hundred hours to, to, to learn that. Uh, but if you make that a priority, as I did, I mean, that has paid dividends. I, I can't even, it, it's been, I, I can't even venture a guess as to all the content I put out on Instagram now on YouTube, it, it, it probably would be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars um, if I had all that content I'd hired hired professional crews for. So I spent a hundred hours of my own time over the course of several months making this my hobby and learning how to do it, and it has literally saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, of course, I would have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on this, but I've been able to create hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of content because I took some time to learn how to do it. Okay, and then can you talk to the results? Uh, yeah, as far as like what that has gotten me? Yes, because... It yeah, I mean, at this point, you know, different. and again, I'm lucky enough to be able to have grown a pretty good following. You know, it's, it's, certainly there's plastic surgeons who have, you know, five, ten times as many followers as I do, but I think I built a quality, a quality following. There's no purchased followers, where again, if you guys are interested in this stuff, do not purchase followers. It's, like, it's the biggest waste of time and money and an insult to your credibility. So, um, but uh, because of this nice following that I built, literally at least half of the patients come in my office, if they're not there because they've seen me on Instagram and because a friend has you know, referred them to my Instagram account, um, they've, they've, if not that, then they've, you know, found me on Google or, or some other site and then they've checked me out on Instagram and then they follow me and say, hey, look, this guy has good results or, hey, look, this guy's teaching in this one video about X, Y, or Z, or this guy seems trustworthy or he seems well credentialed. Um, so, I mean, it really has been it, it, at least half of my business is now coming from social media. Wow. And by the way, I saw you on TV last week. <laughs> so can you, yeah. how did that happen? Um, uh, this was a follower. I can't remember it. I, 
I, I think this particular follower found me on Instagram and she was happy with the work I did for her and she had a connection in the TV industry and the local news station. And, um, you know, she hooked me up with them. They needed, you know, of course, every station needs like a go-to person for X, Y, or Z. And uh, they needed someone for a plastic surgery story six months ago. And she said, hey, check out my guy. I went in. They thought I did a good job. So then when this breast uh, implant story broke uh, earlier this week, um, I was the first guy they had in mind. So they called me back again. So like this one example of how one thing leads to another, it's all interconnected. So, you know, without me having spent the time on Instagram, I wouldn't have gotten that patient. I wouldn't have gotten this uh, local news exposure. And that's exactly why I say be everywhere you can be. You just never know. And it is all interconnected. And every all of your efforts, just when you think you're wasting your time, something pops. So oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's all worth it. Uh, it's just You just have to figure out who you are, though. Are you the kind of person to learn videography or learn how to use your phone as a marketing tool? Or well, the, the phone, it's interesting you said that because I, I sound like a broken record, but things change so rapidly yeah. in this new digital world that you know, three years ago when I first started doing these, it was everything I did was on my SLR camera on a tripod with, you know, a, a boom microphone on a pole. Um, now, this this latest iPhone is just incredible. The pictures it takes are, are stunning. The video it takes is amazing. So and, and the apps are even better as well. So now I'm finding uh, at like probably 75 percent of what I'm putting out on my Instagram page. I'm done. I'm doing with just my iPhone and video editing tools as an app. So if I'm on an airplane, if I am, you know, between patients, if I'm, uh, you know, waiting for my next case to start, I'm in the break room, you know, editing a video on my phone. It's like, uh, that's half the trick these days is you don't have to put in the same amount of effort and time. There's apps that make it easier. And the, 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 um, the AV quality on the new iPhones, and I'm assuming the new Androids and whatever, it, it's just unbelievable. So it's becoming less and less likely that you need to resort to those other options. Um, just out of curiosity, I have got to upgrade my phone. I'm still on um, iPhones. I think it's called a 6X or something. Um, uh -huh. Which iPhone do you use? Um, I use the, the, it's the latest one. I think it's the, the 10, I, I don't even know the letter R. RS or something. It, it's it's the latest one, it, and it's just like two of the latest ones. One is known for having particularly good uh, audio video, so I think that's it. It's well worth the investment. I you know, which I, I don't even know if it costs like a thousand. I got it through the phone plan. You know how that works. But even if it's a thousand dollars, even if it's fifteen hundred dollars, yeah. it is the most important tool in your arsenal for your marketing. So even if it were five thousand dollars, I wouldn't think twice about getting the best new iPhone. And I'm not kidding about that. I don't say that lightly. Five thousand dollars is a lot of money, but when you think about what you spend along your other avenues, it's just incredibly important. So it's worth money. Okay, I, I've been hesitant about the ten because I lose that little button, and I'm I'm so used to it. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. The little control button. So anyway, I, I need to get over that. You can't use anything else like it? You know, it takes a couple of days of being a little bit awkward with it, and then you forget about it. Right? Yeah, I'm I'm all about growth, so no problem. So uh -huh. um, you have really shined in the marketing department and that's unusual usually surgeons that's not the first place they shine they you know they just hone in on their surgical skills more and more and you you do that but you know where the real I mean the real growth is in marketing um, so you've got that covered now let's talk about just running a practice because it's not enough to be a good surgeon and then a good marketer now you've got to be a good manager of a, of a practice and what have you had like how's that been going running a practice like um finding staff managing staff um how how is that going for you it's the, it's the hardest part of what i do um everyone has their strengths and weaknesses my strength is as you mentioned you know i think i'm an excellent surgeon I'm sure every surgeon thinks they're an excellent surgeon but i think i'm an excellent surgeon um i think i'm an excellent marketer but when it comes to you know the the science of running a business. That's always been a challenge for me. I'm not a businessman. I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in running a business. I'm not passionate about running a business. And, uh, you know, you're never going to be excellent at, at something you're not passionate about. And I think the key there is, you know, realizing what your strengths are, embracing those strengths, uh, those strengths, 
and then bringing in help when in, in those areas where you're not passionate about and you're, it's not your particular skill set, which is why we you know, brought you on as a consultant because, you know, like you said, you've dealt with you know, hundreds or thousands of practices over the years. And, you know, running businesses, particular aesthetic businesses, is your strong suit. So that's why we brought you in. Um, and that's, that's the way I, I think any smart person, any successful person, be it a politician, be it a surgeon, be it uh, an attorney, be it a, you know, someone opening up a landscaping business, you, 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 take, you do a mental inventory. What are my strengths? Embrace them. And what your strengths are not, either, you know, if you can realistically learn them, learn them. Or if not, uh, or the time is not there, then you bring in other people whose passion is running a business, whose passion is, you know, the HR. Uh, HR for me is like, you know, the you know bringing finding finding the right people for a team is always just incredibly challenging because um, you know bringing them on trying to interview um, trying to find the right person to fit and gel with your team that is always the hardest you know dealing with um, uh, intra office dynamics and you know um, employee X Y or Z has a problem with you know, A B or C like it just that stuff is is always challenging for me, um, and uh, you know I, I think my strengths are elsewhere. And I think a lot of surgeons are like that. A lot of surgeons, you know, they, they're they're great at what they do. They're great at the science of things. They're great at the you know the operating and the taking care of patients. But we're you know it's a cliche. We're typically horrible businessmen because we're just not taught that and it's not uh, not aligned with what our passions are. So I think you know the running of a business has always been a, a difficult aspect for me. Well, it's funny, a lot of the older guys, um, I'll just say guys, because a lot of them have their wife in the practice working with them. And typically the wife didn't get there. I will tell you, normally the wife didn't get there until there was an embezzlement issue or some some crap hit the fan is really what happened. Um, but in your case, you have the best wife. She's unbelievable because, it, you know, there are pros and cons to adding a wife to the practice. The dynamics of that can go sideways fast, but um, t- tell tell them about the role of your that your wife plays because she's just significant. Um, uh, she's done a just a great job, and I can't always say that. Sometimes the wife is more of a problem than a help, but in this case, uh, she's been great. Well, this is great to say because I know she listens to your podcast, so um, so uh, <laughs> so all the compliments we get throw her way is going to be. Yeah. Is gonna um, is make uh, make me happy. So, um, but uh, yeah, she has done a tremendous job. She has a actually um, you know background as you know in, in law. She went to law school, and we had um, an issue in our practice where we needed to bring her in as an interim um, uh, practice manager. Um, you know, it, it's inter- it's interesting because you know bringing in a family member, a spouse to run things on the business end is a um, some ways it's fantastic because who better to trust with you know your baby your practice you know there, there's so many trust issues that go on with the, the the person that runs a practice for you that to bring in a family member a spouse no less um, you're both on the same team your your interests and um, your goals are completely aligned 100 percent and in that regard it's fantastic um, however you know on the other end um, you know it, people, when I tell people, a lot of people that, you know, right now she's still working as interim practice manager, as you know. But um, when I tell people that, like, oh, my God, what are you, crazy? How do you guys do it? Like, and yeah, it is tough because, you know, you know, all day we're both thinking and talking about work. And you come home and all night we're thinking and talking about work. Um, so it gets to be almost overload on the professional aspect of things. And it's not as easy to just kind of sit back and enjoy dinner and just talk about, oh, well, so what was, what was your day like? Or what was your, you know, tell, you know, talk about non-work things. I think every, every, every person, every couple needs to you know, have a break from work. And when it is, you know, when both people are working for the practice, um, it does get tough. There's no respite. There's no relief from that constant work focus. Um, so th- that, that's the other side of the coin. So that's a, definitely a challenge. Um, so, you know, we're always kind of focusing on that and trying to make sure that we take a breather and, you know, we have a vacation coming up the week after next, you know, just taking some time to to, to stop and take a breather. And um, and like I said, she is interim practice manager right now. We're, 
you know, and uh, on the lookout for a new practice manager, someone who can full time take the reins and and then relegate her to a more overarching, bigger picture role. Because with her law background, she she is valuable. A lot of these, you know, running a business is so intertwined with the law that we'd like to morph her into a different role and have someone take on the more traditional practice manager role. And I love the dynamics. Um, her, your wife's father owns what the most well known car dealerships in the area and she's in those ads and they have the most adorable little baby well how old is your baby uh he's coming up on 14 months <laughs> he's adorable so Thank you. You, you're using him in your marketing as well and she's also on tv so i just love you guys really have the marketing down you know well, thanks yeah i think yeah, every every business has a strong suit and lucky lucky for us you know um you know, it, it, it aligns our, our strong suit, I think, is one thing that some other practices, you know, maybe they're excellent at, you know, the HR and the right. running of the business and the and the cash flow and all that stuff. You know, us, for our, our strong suit is the marketing. So um, I think it works out well. Well, it's working just fine for you. So where what are your goals? Where are you trying to get to? That's a good question. You know, we, we talk about that often, you know, like um, I've been doing a lot of speaking recently, you know, going to meetings and lectures and whatnot, I really do enjoy the teaching aspect of things. So the more I've done over this past several months, um, I'm really finding I have a passion for the teaching of, you know, uh, you know, at, at the meetings, at courses, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I, I, I don't know, in five years, I'd like to be, you know, further refining the procedures that I do right now. I do, and that's, it's an ongoing process. I used to do rhinoplastics. I don't do them anymore. Um, because, you know, it, it wasn't my strong suit. If I'm not the best at something, I'm, I feel no need to do it. So I gave that up, and now I refer those out. Um, and there's other procedures that I kind of have been referring out more and more. And so I think in five years, I'd like to be focusing on those procedures that I'm passionate about. I think I do an amazing tummy tuck, and I enjoy that. I just did one today, and at the end of the procedure, I look back, and I'm like, you know, wow, that looks awesome. And I'm really proud of that. I think I do that excellently. So I'd like to be focusing more on tummy tucks and breast work. I love doing breast work. Um, I, so I want to be focusing more on those things I think I do particularly well and that bring me a professional joy. And maybe so with the time that right now I'm spending doing other procedures, you know, maybe focus that on you know developing the speaking career and teaching and maybe coming up with a conference or a training course. I've been thinking about that a lot the last past couple of months. So. Um, so I, mean, I think that's where I'd like to be in five years, kind of just honing what I'm doing and spending more time doing what I really love to do. Gotcha. Um, I noticed on Instagram you have a guest coming in from out of the country. What what yeah. is that? Um, well, I, I met him. I was I did a, a couple lectures in Monaco this past year. It was in March at the AMWC. It's like a it's like a gigantic you know, cosmetic meeting in Europe um, focused on non surgical. You know, uh, you know, injection, PDO threads, lasers, uh, more on the non-surgical side of the business. But I met him over there, and he's like a world-renowned injector. Uh, he's invented a bunch of different techniques. He's really well known, um, you know, internationally. So uh, he said, "Hey, I'm I'm doing a couple of courses in in the states. Um, what, what do you think if I, you know, you hosted me for one of your, you know, one of the days?" I mean, absolutely. So so that just uh, we've kept in touch, and now in uh, two or three weeks, he's going to be at my office uh, giving a course on his injection techniques. So, you know, it's it's one of those things I'm really excited about, like sharing of ideas and teaching and staying at the forefront of, you know, of, uh, of newer techniques. So I'm excited about that. I think it'll go well. And then maybe you can go over there and teach them. Yeah, maybe. You know, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. uh, you know this, is, this is part of the whole excitement of uh, being part of a community of people eager to learn and teach. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's one big exchange of ideas. Love it. So um, when you got into practice, or now that you've been around for four years, what do you think was the biggest surprise or what, what surprised you that you didn't, ex you didn't under, you didn't see coming? Um, the biggest surprise? Good question. Um, I guess just the amount of time it takes when you're, running a small business. Um, it all sounds like fun and autonomy and being your own boss, 
That's a very romantic, fun idea. But I think the surprise for me is that it really is, you know, when I know now that any person who's an entrepreneur and who is you know, a startup of a new business, I know now that you know, it's all you think about. It's what you eat, it's what you eat, breathe, and sleep is your business. And I think that's the biggest surprise for me. I thought I, I didn't realize how all-encompassing it would be. It's really like all day, every day. It's what I'm thinking about. You know, at work I'm doing the work, and when I'm at home, I'm planning on you know what we're going to be doing in a month, and two months, and a year, and the and the you know things for the next day. It really is just it takes up you know like ninety five percent of your time, um, and it's rewarding. Like you know, it's many headaches that if I continue to work at the hospital. Um, you know, a couple of years back, being employed by the hospital, like it's a it's a whole new set of headaches, um, and, and 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 you know, anxieties and stresses, um, and nothing is easy about it. Um, so you have to you have to really be in love with your business, in love with the idea of being your own boss and creating something. Because if you're not really into it, there's easier ways to make a living. It's easier to punch a clock. Uh, it's easier to be employed by someone else, but there's something, there's some degree of satisfaction in the struggle, and the you know it gives everything meaning. So, you know, you're building something, you're rolling with the punches, you're learning, you're having successes, you're having failures, and it's just a, it's an interesting ride, and I think it's a more meaningful ride for me than just a punching a clock. Uh, um, speaking of that, like, what's one of your biggest accomplishments from doing this on your own? Because I do know, um, gosh, most surgeons, they're, they're not employable. You know, they, anybody, anybody who has their own business has done it somebody else's way and they don't want to do it that way. They, there's something about them that wants to have the freedom to create the way they want to create. But then that also creates havoc with staff who doesn't think like that. Um, I, I've been surprised, um, how, just like what you said, when you own your own business, you don't go home at five o'clock and shut it down. It never shuts down. You're paying the bills. It, you're completely, everybody's depending on you for paychecks and for staying employed. And it's just a never ending <laughs> pressure. It's a pressure that doesn't go away as long as you're, you know, running the show. Yeah. And people, they only see from the outside, the, the success, you know, the enjoyable part of, wow, it must be great to run your own business. And wow, you must be rolling in, you know, like, and they don't see, they don't know, understand the overhead that it takes to run a practice or the time like, and the stresses and the headaches. And, you know, when you're first starting out, the months that are, that are lean and meager, you know, like uh, they don't see all that. They just see the, oh, it must be cool to have your own business and do well. Um, but it's, it's, you know, once you're in it, you see that it's not all, you know, rose petals for sure hey what's one of your the biggest mistakes you made that we could all learn from um there's, there's so many um <laughs> i you know the i right off the top of my bat is like you know not really researching devices before you buy them because when you get out you know um uh, you're excited when you open your own business you want to you know buy the the flashiest, newest devices. And I think in this business, there's always someone willing to sell a full, new and flashy and untested device. So I've made that mistake more than once where you buy a device without truly, really researching it. These devices cost anywhere from 10000 to to 100000 to $200,000. So, you know, you can't just, you know, see some shiny new thing and get convinced by these slick reps. Uh, they really are convincing. You go to one of these stupid symposiums, these weekend symposiums, and they have you convinced. They have some, you know, glossy speaker, some slick speaker, telling you why you need to have it as part of your practice, and then you buy it, and then you find out six months later it's not as easy as they made it look at the at this symposium price. You know, so then you're then you're hooked in for several years with these payments, um, and you better be using that machine, and you better believe in it because if you bought some $100,000 machine and it's not producing results, uh, you're not going to be using it. But guess what? The you know, Either you're going to use it against your ethics or you're not going to use it and those payments are still rolling in. So I think the biggest mistake I made is, is you know, in being too eager to buy certain devices without letting them be tested by the market, you know, standing the test of time um, and, uh, you know, just, just getting 
getting too excited about devices. I don't think that that was the probably the one of the biggest mistakes I made. To add to that, um, as a consultant, I always question: Do you have a plan for marketing this thing, and do you have the patient um, demand for it? Because too many of these, you're so right about it's so exciting to get. Oh, let's start a new target market. Like let's go after men now, and um, or let's go after this particular body part. But you really have to look at that and say, is that is that going to change things for us enough to invest in this and put the yeah. time, money, and the focus into it? Because yeah, really that, that's the sobering so reality of things. But like again, these they're not stupid. It costs them a lot of money to run these weekend symposia. You know, it costs them. You know, they have to hire some. You know, speaker, they pay tens of thousands of dollars. They have to hire the venue, the you know, the food, the catering. It's those things are expensive. They wouldn't be so popular if they didn't, you know, if they weren't so successful. Those things, they get a hundred physicians or providers in a room, and they make it sound like the most amazing thing. It really is like a medicine show, like the old school medicine shows, where you need this step right up. You need to get this newest device. They give you. You're, you're, you're all crowded in this room watching someone tell you how amazing something is and thinking, showing you how much money you can make doing it. It's like, it, it's so intoxicating that you lose all sense of, of reason and you buy these devices and then you walk out like six months later, like, what the hell was I thinking? So it, it, it really is. You have to be so careful with the, with the way people sell you things in this business. Everything is so expensive and everything is made to sound so amazing when in fact it's most times, you know, nine times out of ten, that device isn't even in, on the market in a year or two, you know? I know when I first, um, many years ago, I used to speak for the laser companies, and it was a very lucrative experience because they would fly me all over the nation, and I was the marketing end of that. So they would have a laser, but then I would, I would do what I'm saying now. I would have a marketing plan. This is how you market this thing. And it was a great gig if you can get it, but now they all have their own marketing departments. But uh, yes, beware when you buy something. Make sure there's a backup plan for how you're going to make it actually profitable in your own practice. Yep. Um, so to wrap things up, why don't you just give us some advice, even to not even just the new guys, even the older guys who've been around, but the world turned upside down for most of us who have been around for a long time. Um, it, you know, this this is all new. Social media is all new. Internet marketing became new. Um, the patient needs and trends have changed. So, like, what advice would you give others? I would say you have to keep up with things because, you know, I've said more than once during this conversation that in just the span of two or three years, things have trained, changed drastically. And that's the hallmark of the new age of digital media. Um, things change rapidly. And look, if you're, if you are a world-renowned surgeon or injector at X, Y, or Z, good for you. You probably have the word of mouth and you are less reliant on you know on these things but for the vast majority of people even some well established surgeons and injectors and 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 physicians you know even if you're well established if you're not up to date with things like social media then I I say this in my talks there's going to be some hot shot you know know it all who knows nothing you know fresh out of residency who's going to be marketing him or so, herself as an expert and they're going to be taking your patients because the, the Instagram consumer doesn't know any better. So if you want to, if you care about continuing to attract new patients, um, you have to stay up on these things. And it's not easy, but you have to, you know, it, it, it demands a, a certain degree of time. It demands a certain degree of, of financial investment. Uh, if you want to stay relevant, you have to keep up with these things. Um, because if not, you're just going to get left in the dust. Right. Okay, that is it for us. Um, this was Dr. Christian Subio. If you want to check out his very cool introductory video, keep in mind he did it himself. It's amazing. Um, it's at his uh, homepage at drsubio.com, S-U-B-B-I-O. Um, Dr. Subio, I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for your insights. Um, it, it's fantastic. Keep up the good job and say hi to your wife for me. No, I mean, and Catherine, I, I could give you a plug as well, like an unsolicited plug. You know, uh, like I said, I I saw you spoke at meetings. I read your book. I was 
very impressed with you before we decided to bring you on as a consultant. And, uh, and since we have, you're, you've just been invaluable. Your insights are just amazing. As someone who has worked with so many practices, you're, you're a pleasure to work with, and more importantly, you're efficacious and a good investment. So I would highly recommend anyone who's, you know, newer in the business or maybe just looking to revamp and, and you know, kind of uh, reevaluate your own processes that uh, you've been an excellent investment. You know, you're worth every penny and then some. So if I could give you a small plug as well. Oh, I really appreciate that. So everybody, would you please subscribe to Beauty and the Biz and please share this with your colleagues and staff. And then of course, always get a hold of me if you've got comments or questions or you have an idea uh, for a topic or you want to be a guest on the show, you just let me know. And you can follow me at Instagram at Katherine Maley MBA. Okay, that's it for us this time. Talk to you later. We hope you found valuable insight on this episode of Beauty and the Biz. For more episodes, tools, and Catherine's free book, visit www.catherinemaley.com. That's www.catherinemaley.com. And be sure to subscribe to get the latest practice building strategies delivered to you. And don't forget to share this Beauty in the Biz podcast with your staff and colleagues.